Hi, welcome to Allergy Dragon's Lair. My name is Martha Morgan. I'm a specialty diet and allergy chef. I happen to have celiac disease and a couple of food allergies, but my biggest claim to fame is actually raising a child with over 30 food allergies and celiac disease. Welcome to the podcast. So I know I always say this and I really do mean it. I'm super excited for this episode. So, but before I introduce our special guest, we're going to go into a quick disclaimer. The views expressed here on our show are the personal opinions and life experiences of ours and our guests. We are not healthcare providers or doctors. Please seek advice from your healthcare professional for any diagnoses or changes to your healthcare plan. I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky. Most people know that. And so is my guest that's coming on board right now. Her name is Carrie. At Carrie Beth Collins is her full name. Woo-hoo. She happens to be an artist, a friend of mine. I think I mentioned that already. Um, so I'm just going to brag. Yes, I have an artist friend at, that actually shares some food allergies and things like that and autoimmune diseases and just a whole lot of, you know, things that we have to deal with on a daily basis here on the Allergy Dragon's Lair. And she kindly accepted my invitation to be on my podcast. So Carrie, can you go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody? Hello. I'm Carrie Beth Collins, and like she said, I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky, and dealing with food allergies, just like probably most of your listeners. It's no fun. I know I already went over the fact that uh, you happen to be an artist. Um, We actually met in real life just recently in May. We've been friends online for at least about a year or so, I think, maybe. Okay. So we had never, even though we live in Louisville, Kentucky, we had never met before, and uh, you were actually doing your first solo artist show and so I actually got to go not only admire her work online, but then I actually got to go see your work in person, which was amazing. And uh, my friend Zoe, who you got to meet as well with Invisibly Allergic, she got to go and we all just kind of hung out. Really, it was just so much fun to meet you in real life. And then from that, we have blossomed into more of actual real in real life friends. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and likewise, it was awesome to meet you. And it was so Cool and weird at the same time to have three EpiPens and three people at the table. <laughs> that was, I mean, hey, we were safe, right? We were definitely safe. If anybody was having any issues, we all had plenty of hand wipes to wipe the tables with off. Uh, we we definitely, we missed the photo op though, because Carrie was like, we need to take a photo of all of our EpiPens and we didn't. Um, <laughs> we were just having too much fun. Next time, next time we'll have to do that. Definitely next time. Yeah, we already mentioned already your food allergies, and then I think you have some autoimmune disease issues. So uh, would you kind of describe what those are, how they affect, you know, the general, simple question, but big answer. (laughs) Oh, that is completely right. So I didn't always have food allergies. I got to grow up normal. I know what a little Debbie tastes like, you know, I got to have a normal childhood. And somewhere along the road, uh, when I was in the hospital, I had pneumonia and I had been running a fever. I actually had walking pneumonia. So I had it for a long time and then it just got, I didn't know it until I just got really bad. And what I mean, really bad, I mean, taking Tylenol and ibuprofen every few hours and still was running a really high fever. Couldn't get rid of it. So I went to the hospital and, uh, I got an antibiotic through an IV at my stay there. And within 24 hours, Within just a few hours, I already started feeling a little better. The fever was getting better. And within 24 hours, I felt 50% better, which was crazy because I had ran a fever for almost a week. So that medication was amazing. But after that, I started, um, I started having some real problems. Like I just didn't feel well. And I knew something was wrong. And I didn't know why I felt that way because normally I have a lot of energy and I could just, I felt really strong, you know, and, and even though I didn't work out, like I, I was a strong person and I started feeling really weak. Like I needed to take a, a, you know, after I take a shower, I need to take a nap kind of thing. I started going to doctor after doctor and, you know, whenever they do the immunity blood work, like the IgG, the IgM, all those different type of tests. There was always something coming up. Things were coming up. My markers were out, but nobody could really nail down what it was. Um, And it really wasn't until I got the biggest portion of the symptoms taken away by figuring out it was a food allergy. After 12 doctors, I have said, can I see if it's something I'm putting in my face? Is it food allergy is really what I was asking, you know? And he's like, sure, let's send you the doctor. And fortunately, uh, my doctor was 72 and he was a food allergy patient himself. And so I described my symptoms, um, just drinking coffee in the morning, 
um, with creamer because I was, I never drank coffee in my life, but I started, I was so tired of starting drinking coffee and then, um, burping it up. I was drinking it at 6am and still burping it up at 6pm and, um, just nauseated all the time and everything stunk and the lights were bright and sounds were getting to me and it was just chronic headache and body aches and just constant. So I was explaining that to him. He's like, okay. So he tested me for what he thought some of the top tens were, but then he also tested me for, um, alpha gal and some other things. So come to find out I'm not alpha gal, but, um, I wasn't that, but I did have a very severe pork allergy plus wheat, and dairy, and all these other things. And I'm like, how did I go from being a garbage disposal? Like I could eat anything. I never got heartburn. It didn't matter. I could eat pepperoni and go to bed at, and, and never wake up with heartburn. You know, I was just like an iron stomach to now I'm sensitive or allergic to 23 things. And then I started seeing late night at TV on TV, like these commercials, like if, if you've ever been given this drug and now you have this symptom, this symptom, and one of them was severe food allergy and the name of the medication caught my ear because I was given that drug. I was like, you know, that was the miracle drug that made me not feel like I was dying, but at least I knew where it came from finally. And around that time, some of the autoimmune stuff started too. So I feel like maybe it was a lifetime of maybe stress and other things. And, you know, if it's teeter-tottering, if your health is teeter-tottering, sometimes all it takes is one little bout of pneumonia or one medication just to tip you over the edge. And that's kind of where my story started. I was always a sensitive kid. Like I, <clears throat> I was born with, um, I was allergic to formula, allergic to pampers, stuff like that. But as far as um, the rest of my life went, you know, I eat stuff all the time and never had problems once I was in a baby. And it's almost like now I'm reverting back to that bubble girl <laughs> type of eating, <laughs> you know, I know, you know, the feeling. So, yeah, my husband used to say, like, when we first got together, he was going to, like, get me a bubble suit at one point. Uh, so I totally yeah. understand that, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, so with the yeah. autoimmune disease issue and like, how old were you when this happened? So like, how long have you been having to really deal with? knowing that it's a food allergy and that kind of thing? Um, I got diagnosed, I think it was like November of 20, I think it was 2016. It was a funny thing, like the day before I had just ate uh, like a sausage biscuit when I was feeling like crap and, and almost didn't go to the appointment. And, and then I was like, oh, it explains why I feel like crap. So I take, I had taken some Benadryl, like after that appointment, I was like, well, let's see if this makes it better. And holy cow, the Benadryl made it better, you know? And I was like, oh, I guess he does know what he's talking about. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that you know as well as I do when you come home with that list of things that you're sensitive to. You're like, what do I eat? Mm -hmm, Did you have yeah. that? Yeah. I had that. I was kind of in denial too, because like I was 26 when I got diagnosed with food allergies, um, right after Vesper got kind of diagnosed as well. And I was like in total denial about chocolate. I was like, there's no way. And so like I really investigated that one very well. I want to, I'm, and now I'm completely, I'm anaphylactic to it. It's, there is no doubt that I am allergic to chocolate, but your list I think is even longer than mine. Cause I know we share some kind of overlapping and then like you share some with Vesper. So, like, <laughs> so do you mind sharing well, your list or some of them? So it started out with tree nuts and blueberries, bay leaves, chickpeas, chia seed, wheat, eggs, um, milk. It was this huge, huge list. And when it had wheat, whenever my doctor, he said, oh, you're allergic, really allergic to pork. And he said, you're also allergic to wheat and dairy. And I was like, oh, no, wheat and dairy. And he said, honey, you're going to have a harder time getting pork out of your diet. And I didn't know what he meant then, but he was right. And I kept thinking, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, but yeah, that, so that after doing complete avoidance for, um, for a long time, like I said, it was like, it, it was a huge list after doing complete avoidance. And then at one point in 2020 or 2019 fasting, um, I've just now got it down to uh, pork. I can't even breathe it for the most part. Um, try not to test that, you know, because who wants to be sick? Um, wheat, uh, if I eat it, it just makes me really sick, but it makes me really sick longer and longer now, which makes me think maybe that one's getting worse. And then Dairy, if it didn't have, if there weren't so many dairy products that had pork in them, I could probably eat it, but it breaks my forehead out. It makes me gain weight. So, I mean, that tells me again, it's a, it's a pretty significant sensitivity. But as far as anaphylaxis, it's, it's just pork right now. And I'm hoping to keep it that way. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, that I, that it no more join the list because as well, you and I both have got exposed to our allergens within the past couple of weeks of each other. And that's, you know, like right now I have no cheekbones because I'm still puffy for mine. Um, so yeah. So you know it, how easy it is to get exposed. I mean, restaurant people are so busy and I don't know about you, but it makes me nervous as heck when they don't write things down. It, it's scary to me. Um, yeah, it so is. Right it now is just those four or just those three. And then um, your autoimmune That's issues fine. popped up about the same time, right? Um, with what you were saying, I think, I believe, if I remember right. Yeah, like um, I've had one of my autoimmune things that I was finally diagnosed with. I've had it since I was 11. Trigeminal neuralgia. So it, it the trigeminal nerve goes from right here. It goes to your eye, the top of your mouth and your lower jaw, you know, those three branches of it. Plus, you know, there's some stuff branching out back here. And it's just uh, when this nerve gets inflamed, sometimes it can get inflamed from a tumor. Sometimes it can get inflamed from um, just arthritis encroaching around it. And <clears throat> Sometimes I, I mean, I'll, I'll go out on a limb to say this. I think sometimes it's from the food we eat because I'll tell you a story in a minute about how I've managed mine without medication. Um, but it's just severe, severe pain. And when it's on my scalp, like I have to like hover my head over the pillow. Like I have to hang part of it because you can't lay your head on that side. Um, you know, it's just these really severe attacks in my eye and on the side of my tongue. It's really strange. Anytime I have dental work, it like shh, that nerve up. And you get the attack for a few days after. Um, I started noticing this really severe pain after I would eat. It was always happening in my dining room. And I was like, what the heck? And it was after I ate or um, after I ate, I brushed my teeth. And a lot of times if I'm not going anywhere else, I'll wash my face for the night. So any kind of rhythmic movement on your face can trigger it. And the treatment for it, I started taking medication because it was getting really bad. Um, it was happening three and four times a day. And then the scalp was just there all the time. Um, the treatment for it is to have, you know, they shave the back of your head and they go back here and they relieve the nerve or, uh, you can take Lyrica or some other type of, you know, the anti neuropathy drugs. And I was taking that and it worked like a charm. Um, the problem with that drug is you have to keep going up and I didn't really want to ever go up from the starter dose. Symptoms were coming back. And then in 2018, I had dealt with infertility for years. So it was just like perfect timing. And I got pregnant and I had to come off of Lyrica. And when I came off of the Lyrica, um, the symptoms just were uh, excruciating. And so I couldn't be on that while I was pregnant. I got onto a support group on Facebook and I said, does anybody know any triggers that are food for trigeminal neuralgia? And someone said, dairy, try giving up dairy. And um, I gave it up. And that alone has helped me manage it. I still get the little sizzles and I still get like today I had a little attack, but I don't have to take medication every day. So I feel like, so that was one of them was the trigeminal neuralgia. That's changed now without medication. Um, Sjogren syndrome. That's one of the, the autoimmune diseases. I have psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And at one point I was on seven medications and no longer on any of them, but that doesn't mean I have, don't have bad days. Like right now I'm having a very bad day from um, all the stress and I'm puffy and a lot of pain, but, um, I'm here, you know, I've, I figured show up as I am. This is, this is real life, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, sometimes we have to power through those days. I think anybody that's listening right now knows how it feels and, you know, mm -hmm. that we have to advocate. And like the biggest lie we say every day is I'm fine. It really is. Yeah. Um, and so the recording kind of messed up a little bit. So you said you're completely off of, um, well, we, I'm, I'm assuming it's messed up on the recording, but we've been glitching a little bit. So you said you were off of all of your medications then? Yeah, I'm off of all the medications now. If I wanted to feel better, I could, you know, I, I could go back on the medications for arthritis and all of that stuff, but I could either do that or I could try to eat a little better. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those are the, and manage my stress a little better. Um, that's, that's going to be a lifelong lesson for me though. You know, those are, but I don't want to go on the medication. So I kind of just suffer through it because I feel like it's kind of a litmus test. Like, am I stressing myself out right now? Yes. I'm feeling really bad. You know, like I don't want to just, um, like if you're driving and your check engine light comes on and you just pull out the spark plug, plug that lights it up. That's what I feel like medicine does. A lot of times it kind of covers it. 
but it's also has its place too. It's very life-saving. It's, you know, like um, I had to use the lidocaine patch this week on my back. Mm -hmm. You know, there, it has its place, but I don't want it to cover up what my body is trying to tell me either. So, yeah. Yeah. I think we have to figure out and do what, what is right for us. And that's, that's what mm -hmm. I kind of try to share with everybody. And, and I don't take a lot of medications either for mine with the, with all invisible diseases, just like, you know, it's find comfort in people talking about it. Um, mutual people that know that, you know, about, you know, friendships like, like ours, you know, it's, it's really it's good now that we can connect more than we used to about it. And then people aren't telling you you're a liar about it. Like when I was, you know, growing up, cause I've had my RA since I was four, you know, people would call me a liar because it wasn't real. You know, kids don't have arthritis. Like, you know, it's not real. So you stop telling people. Right. And then people don't, <clears throat> people don't understand why um, you don't have the energy to do certain things. You know, I, I know that um, when I was at my sickest, you know, I was sick for like six years before it was figured out. You beat yourself up and then your friends think that you have no interest in them or whatever, because you're, they're like, you want to go out and do this? It requires all this energy. And you're like, not really. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you stay home a lot. And I look back at pictures of myself. I used to do a lot of camping and going to concerts. And I look back at pictures of myself and I'm sitting there like holding a hot dog <laughs> and like, wondering why I was like ready to to vom you know later on that night and it's because I, you know I, I had a food allergy that was then diagnosed and no wonder I felt like I was dying all the time and I wasn't fun and all I could do was just either feel bad and be quiet or complain about how bad I felt you know that it like consumes you and you don't you know that something's not right you know you're supposed to feel good in your body you know that's what a that's the way we're built to be but when you have all this stuff and you don't know why you, you just, you feel like a, a shell of yourself and then you compare yourself to what you used to be. Well, I used to wake up and jump up and do this. And, and now I need a nap after a shower, you know, and the guilt doesn't help, mm -hmm. but trying to um, be your own advocate and figure out where the problem stems from has been the biggest thing for me. I mean, I just got sent for one expensive test after another, after another, well, this popped up, but it doesn't really mean anything. It's like, okay, well, why did you do the test then? Why did you, you know, why did I pay $800 copay for a test? Um, it's just this huge process. So my friends have started saying, where can you go to eat? And I'd love to go, <laughs> you know, like the real friends, um, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that don't mind going to places and not ordering pork at the table and different things like that. You know, those friends have stuck around and you do feel like a, like this delicate flower, like it's just some excuse or something like that. Like you said, people didn't believe you had arthritis as a child. And um, they, they almost think like it's a preference or something, like mm -hmm. I'm some extreme vegan or something. Then, and it's not the case. Um, but even if I was like, what's their business, right? <laughs> to get angry yeah. with you for being special at the table when you're ordering. Yeah. And, and like you said, and I was thinking it before you said it, which is like the real friends will understand the real friends will, mm -hmm. will, will understand why we have to pick and choose our things because we are trying to save up because we really want to go see this concert or we have an event. Um, and some people understand it and some people don't. And the people that don't understand it, I say they, they either will eventually learn about it or they just weren't meant to be your friend. That's right. Yeah. I would say to anybody who just doesn't feel well, just to keep keep searching ended up being something to keep me out of surgery or off medication. It's worth looking into and just to keep like untangling. It's like this big knot, you know, food allergies, autoimmune, there's just this big knot and you don't know what causes what. And you just have to, it's like untangling necklaces or something, you know, you're just finally figuring out the, all the mysteries. And I don't know that we'll ever figure them all out, but at least you figure some out or at least what works for you so that life is manageable again. I love that analogy. Okay. Um, so there's something in there for that. It's beyond the string theory. It's the knot theory. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. You are an artist. I love your work. I think it's very interesting. Very pretty. Thank you. You're welcome. We went to core gallery a couple weeks ago. Um, my, my cousin Amy went in and then I got to brag and I was like, yeah, look, there's, you know, got to see a couple of your, your paintings that were still there from your first show there in May. So you're a full-time artist. You're obviously not letting 
you know, all these things hold you back. So can you kind of go into like your art, why you do what you do? Sure. So I feel like art has saved me many times um, at my lowest lows, you know, whenever I didn't feel well or the loss of my mom or we, we lost my pregnancy. I lost that, you know, at the, at the, some of the hardest times in my life, it seems like art has always been my fallback. It used to be my hobby. I was a dental hygienist for 23 years and loved my patients. Favorite dentist that I ever worked for, he retired in 2016. And when he retired, it was just never the same again. The, the practice just it lost its heart, you know, whenever he retired. Um, I was working for somebody new and it, it was okay, but it wasn't just, you know, I was just feeling bad again. I still didn't have everything figured out with my food allergies and autoimmune stuff. So um, <clears throat> I went to part-time and when I went to part-time, shortly after that COVID hit, I just didn't want to go back anymore. So I was like, well, what should I do? And trying to figure out, you know, do I want to work at Trader Joe's, <laughs> try something completely different? Do I want to go back to school and get an education? And, you know, I said a few weeks, just kind of mulling the idea around. And I'm like, why don't I try to do what I've been doing as a hobby is something to like stress relieve. Why don't I try doing this full time? And there were no art shows going on because nothing was going on at that time. So I figured it was a great time to uh, learn how to do um, a website and to learn how to do social media. And um, I started there. And then in 2021, I decided to follow around a seasoned artist. She's a second generation artist, uh, art artist, and learn how to do things like start a ratchet strap and put up a tent properly and weight it so you don't fly into your neighbor with a strong wind. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that in 2021. And then in, in October of that year, they were looking for artists for St. James Art Show. They had a few openings and my friend told me to supply. And that's when I did my very first art show like outdoors with St. James. And that was like baptism by fire. <laughs> like there's 700 artists at this thing. So it's like, it's a well-oiled machine. They're like wrangling cats, you know what I mean? <laughs> but they, they, they do it so well. And then I was like, okay, for the past two years or so, um, I've been putting in all the work. And uh, so I got myself together a nice big schedule. And last year was my first full-time year. And it's kind of weird when I apply at art shows, it says, do you have any special needs? Yes, please do not put me next to a pork tenderloin. <laughs> um, vendor, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, cause yeah, I can't even imagine, uh, what that would be, you know, just things that I even getting, I don't know if you're this way, but I get anxiety just from smelling it. I'm just like, Oh God. So that's one of the weirdest things on my application. And I know the people reading the apps have to be like, well, what, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's truth. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's better. You know, now not to put me near the port person, but yeah, there's certain yeah. things like I, I love the smell of fresh baked bread. And I also like, hate the smell of fresh break bread, break bread, that baked bread. Jeez, I can't talk. Yeah. Cause then I'm like, oh my gosh, how much flour is in the air and things like that. So yeah, it's so mm -hmm. certain smells really freak me out. And even like, I don't know, past trauma for my kid or things like that. I'll smell fish in the air and I start to freak out like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, Vesper's not here. You're okay. Fine. Calm down. You know, <laughs> like, but um, yeah, no, right. I understand it. I understand. But that's amazing. I think it's awesome that you've done the full year. And like I said, your artwork is really cool. Can you describe exactly what you paint? Um, and I will obviously leave a link down below and on the podcast so they can check out your website and your art. Sure. So I'm a black light painter. Um, I make paintings out of acrylic paint and they glow in the dark or are all black light reactive. And it's kind of a niche, but I was raised by two teenage parents and it was in the seventies and there was black light stuff around our house. And my dad's always been fascinated with flashlights and black lights. And so he gave me one, one day he had bought it at a yard sale for a dollar and I still have it and I still use it to finish my paintings. So I started mixing up paint and painting the painting one time and then putting the black light in. I was like, oh, this is ugly. It's not very pretty. So then I had to come up with a system of how to finish these paintings and make them look nice under a black light. So I paint them once for the day and then I put wait till it gets dark and put black lights on it again and paint it again under a black light. The customers get to come in and, and play with the black lights in my booth and um, at my solo exhibit that you were at, we get to shut the lights out. That was so cool. I'd never got to do that before. Um, and people really like it or they just think eh, it's okay, you know, but it's not for everybody. I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but 
people who like it. They tend to like music festivals and uh, really bright, happy stuff. People walk in my booth and they go, oh my gosh, it's so happy in here. And I kept hearing that from people over the years that I, I everything's happy and it's so joyful in here. Um, and one of my neighbors at an art show, her husband was a photographer and he would have like photos of uh, like a boat on still water or, you know, a sunrise or something. And she said to me, she said, Tom, that was his name. Tom sells peace. You sell joy. And I was like, huh, I like that. So uh, I started a series called Bursting with Joy. And, um, and a lot of my stuff is kind of named after that. But it didn't really start out that way. Like in 2012, after my mom had passed, I did this one series where I did a lot of writing and it was kind of deep stuff, you know, about coming out of darkness or pain or healing. And um, I had a lot of these paintings around, but I didn't really want to sit and stare at them. So I auctioned them off for a kitty cat shelters and animal shelters and for um, like a recovery center for women. And that brought me joy. I kind of like gave all the healing that I had got from painting them away. I didn't want to stare at them anymore. I knew where I was in my head when I was painting them. And I don't want to keep revisiting that, but other people, it brought them some comfort. So, um, so that was kind of where it started. And then from there, I guess it just kind of got, kept getting happier and more powerful. And now my stuff is mostly plants and I'm starting a mushroom line. It's going to be called mushroom magic. <laughs> and oh, cool. um, yeah. So, and then, bursting with joy so you know like I said art has saved me many times um and I keep feeling like keep feeling like it, it it's connected me with the right people in my life I guess that's my favorite thing about it is the connections I make with people whether it's in my booth or just like me and you connecting online or the the people that um message me um, you know I I don't know I like those connections even though I'm an introvert I still really like those connections <laughs> You, you can be introverted and still have connections with people and then you still crave connection. And then it's like, okay, I must now go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I must now decompress yeah. from all my connecting. <laughs> exactly. It's like, oh, too much. Yeah. The coolest thing about your art for me was the fact that I seen it online. I liked it, but seeing it in person was totally different. And the fact that you really kind of get two pieces in one, like people don't understand that. When you turn the light on, it's completely different. Um, Cause we got to like go look at everything beforehand uh, or with the lights off. And they were like, pull, put the lights on. And then it was totally different. It wasn't bad either, but it was just to like the colors completely changed. Um, and some, in some aspects, like what you would feel from the painting would totally different. Like sometimes it would be like, oh, but I mean, it's kind of within the same line, but it, 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 I don't know. I, that's the only way I can describe it. It's like getting two paintings in one. So um, like a bargain, like if you look at it, you're like, hey, listen, <laughs> you need two paintings for one. <laughs> I need to use that. <laughs> yeah, use that and sell it. two um, one. <laughs> yeah, that's like a deal. Um, I do not own one yet, but I do. There's, uh, like oh. I said, there was quite a few. We really liked, me and Zoe really liked the show and, and then my uh, cousin, Amy, when she got to see it in person. But yeah, definitely, if, if you get a chance, if you happen to be um, here local, um, I know you've done some, like, you've been some in Ohio, right? Or in Indiana or both? Yeah, I've, oh. uh, last year, it was several states. But this year, oh. I have to keep it a little bit more focused because uh, my dad was diagnosed uh, with cancer. So I've, I'm going to be here very locally for everything. The farthest one I'm doing is Lexington, which is only like an hour and a half. But I did one just recently in Ohio. Yeah, before all yeah. that. See, I so really this do year follow I'm you. It local and yeah, you do. You're you're pretty yeah. awesome. <laughs> like I don't even think I don't even think my friends know as much as you. You know, like the friends I've known for 20 years don't know this much. So yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll be doing a lot here locally in the Louisville area, and um, not as many. Of the, this year though like I said I'm slowing down from last year um because I can make money anytime but I can't always like be there for my dad like this mm -hmm. so I'm making sure that that's the priority right now um and you know that you know when there's people are more important than money any day so mm -hmm. yeah I, I agree with that so I always ask everybody uh who has been on the show uh is there anything at all that you want to either leave a thoughts or something that you wanted to make sure was said before you leave or before we wrap up 
Uh, the only thing I can think of is like, okay, so we talked about niches with my work, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like there's a niche in the allergy community that hasn't been met. And I don't know how to meet it, but I would love it if there were like an Uber for allergies. That is a very good point, you know, and that's like a whole nother can of worms. And I love, that's one of the reasons I love to ask this question of everybody, because it's like, that is be another thing that we must talk about on the Allergy Dragon Lair podcast. So if anybody else has any thoughts or, or anything with that or have had that same issue and had success, maybe actually using an Uber Eats or, or different types of things, let us know. And um, we'll address that in another episode because I would love to have you come back on at some point, Carrie. Oh, I'd, I'd love to be here. I like I, your podcast is so fun. I love listening to it. And I learn so much every time because I only really know about my allergy and it's interesting to hear when you hear what all food's made of and what all stuff people have to avoid, you know, it's, it's so much more complicated than people ever really know because, you know, in order to make food taste good, it's got 10,000 ingredients in it sometimes, you know, and that's not the only way, but anything packaged, it's like, it's got a million different things in it. Mm-hmm. And so it's fascinating to hear um, what other people have, but so once again, thank you so much for taking the time to be on my show. Um, I love you dearly. You know that I'm, I'm sure, or at least I hope you do. (laughs) I love you, Martha. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. That's really awesome that you do this. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for everybody that is out there listening, um, on allergy dragon layer podcast, whether you're here watching us on YouTube or you're listening um, on one of the other platforms, make sure to subscribe and like, and ask questions, you know, all that good stuff. I will definitely put links down below so you can check out Carrie Beth and make sure to follow her on her socials so you can actually go see some of her artwork in person. Online, it doesn't do it justice. So if you think it's pretty online, believe me, in person, it's even better. And we will talk to you all later. Thanks so much. And we'll see you. Bye. Bye.